because we are social beings reared in a social way of life, all of us have to communicate with one another to give expression to our feelings and thoughts. Obviously, get the other fellow to think or feel or do something. Listen. Fire! Fire! Everybody out! I love you, Joan. You won't find a more attractive hat in town. Hi, my lord, hi. A soldier and a beard. And that's the news of the world today. Now for the local news. Whatever its purpose, every communication is an activity in which people arrive at common understandings. Consider, for example, the way in which this policeman communicates. When he gives this signal, he gets this response from the driver. The driver responds to the idea of stopping, to his recollection of what might happen if he didn't stop, and to the policeman himself as a symbol of authority. Of course, the same ideas could be evoked by a mechanical signal. Or they could be evoked by a word. Language, written and spoken, is our principal tool of communication. Words, sentences, and statements form symbols which we can use to convey almost all meaning. But to use language effectively, we have to make other people understand what we are saying as well as understand ourselves what they are saying. Every communication situation has these elements. The communicator, or person doing the talking. The content of his message. The medium or method of communication he is using. The audience to whom he is speaking and the response the audience is making to his message. Each of these elements is important for effective communication. In any situation, we may ask, who is saying what to whom with what effect? In other words, who is talking? What is he saying? What medium is he using? To whom is he speaking? And what response is he getting? Knowing the answers to these questions helps us to act more effectively in any situation, either as the communicator or as the audience. First, let's consider what happens when someone else is doing the talking. Other people are constantly bombarding us with communication. Who are these communicators and what are their purposes in speaking to us? Knowing this helps us to respond more intelligently to what they are saying. For example, Mrs. Clark, like most of us, considers who is talking and what her purpose is in a situation like this. Oh, I don't know. These new styles. But it's such a nice style on you. No. Thank you. I'll try somewhere else. Likewise, Mrs. Clark considers who is talking and what his purpose is in a situation like this. Say, Mom, are you and Dad going out tonight? Why, George? Does it matter whether we're going out? Oh, I don't know. I just thought maybe you weren't. They've got some awful good TV programs on tonight, you know. But you're going to the dance tonight, aren't you? Yes, but... And I suppose you want the car again. Well, young men, you'll have to take that up with your father. Oh, Mom. Yes, when Mrs. Clark knows the communicator, she considers his purpose in communicating as well as what he is saying but she may not do this in every situation. Well, that's settled. The town can't afford the new community house we've all been shouting for. What makes you think that settles it, dear? The town needs that building and we're going to get it. But they say it costs too much. Who says so? Well, they say so. Right here, in the paper. 
You mean Jim Thompson and his gang says so? I'd look twice at whatever he says about that community house. Why do you say that? If it's in the paper, it must be right. In this situation, Mrs. Clark has not asked who is talking. But Mr. Clark tries to consider the source of most statements. He happens to know that this statement comes from a group of people who always oppose community projects that might add to taxes. Knowing this helps him to judge the statement more intelligently. Another question to ask when someone else is doing the talking is this. What do his words and statements mean to him? What is he really trying to say? Our friend the policeman communicates effectively because his signal means exactly the same thing both to himself and his audience. But the meanings of words and statements are seldom exact, and they seldom mean quite the same thing to different people. Just think, next year we'll all be in college. Yep, I'm going to state, I guess. Oh, Bill, what do you want to go to state for? Why don't you come along and go to Caldwell with me? Caldwell? I don't know much about it. What kind of a place is Caldwell? It's a pretty classy place. Good fraternities, keen girls, everybody has a car. A lot of kids with dough go there. Oh, it's that kind of place, is it? No, I guess I'll just go to state. The difference between Bob and Bill lies in the meaning of a few words. And a lot of kids with dough go there. Bob's interests and experiences have made this a pleasant idea to him. But to Bill, these words have just the opposite emotional meaning. Many of the words we use have somewhat different emotional meanings for people with different experiences. I am honored today to present to you the next mayor of our city. He is a friend of labor, a friend of business, a friend of every group and interest in our community. Mr. John P. Garrison. Mr. Cox gives an emotional response to one of the speaker's statements. He is a friend of labor. These words suggest to him certain uncomfortable experiences he has had with some of his employees. The words also have an emotional meaning for Mr. Garvey, another businessman. To him, they suggest the satisfaction he once derived from his association with a labor organization. Everyone responds emotionally to words and statements. If we are aware of these feelings, we are better able to control our responses. Now, of course, when we are doing the talking and someone else is listening, our problem is how to make ourselves understood. That is, how to use language that will establish our meanings with our audience. The first question to consider is, who is this audience? What are its past experiences or predispositions? Obviously, we would never try to explain algebraic equations to this pair of youngsters. We know they haven't the maturity and experience to understand them. The same thing goes for all the people we talk to every day. All of them are different personalities, having somewhat different experiences behind them, giving them somewhat different predispositions. All of them take the words we use to mean something a little different. Knowing our audience even helps us in such an obvious matter as using words it understands. A doctor, for instance, puts it this way to a patient. Henry, you've got a bad case of athlete's foot. One of the worst cases I've seen. We'll try to do something about it. But to a colleague, he puts it this way. By the way, Doctor, I had an acute case of epidermal phytosis today. But knowing our audience does more than this. It also helps us to put our ideas into words that will move our listeners to respond as we wish. Frank, give me back that letter. Mother, make him stop it. Helen's got a letter. Oh. Helen's got a letter. Now, Frank, stop that. Give Helen back her letter. And stop being such a baby. Oh, all right. Here, Helen. And Helen, 
I'm surprised at you scuffling around like a like a regular roughneck. Mother knows just what symbols to use to make Frank and Helen respond as she wishes. We can generally get a more favorable response to an idea if we use words and statements having the right emotional appeal. Hello, George? Yes, I'm fine, thank you. George, I'm calling to remind you about your contribution to the community chest. Now, this is a new year, you know. Yes, um, well, I don't know whether I can give as much this year. Well, George, to tell you the truth, we're asking you to give more if you can. The people that count have to support this thing, you know. This is a decent, clean, prosperous community, and we've got to keep it that way. All right. You've got a good point there. I'll send you a check. Language appealing to self-esteem and civic pride is effective in this situation. But with a different audience, another set of symbols is needed. Hi, fellas. Oh. You fellas make your contribution to the community chest yet? Nah. <laughs> you don't think you can get any dough off of us, do you? We're just working for coffee and donuts around here. Well, but you're working, aren't you? What about people too sick to work? People out of luck. They need help, don't they? What about the clinics for kids and the help that goes to mothers and older folks? We've got to give those people a hand. Yeah, I suppose we do. This audience responds to a different set of words, though the underlying idea is the same. Besides using the right language, we have also to use the right medium of communication to reach our audience. Most of us know already how important it is to choose the right situation. For instance, we wouldn't try to discuss a weighty problem at a time like this. Likewise, we would never try to make a serious speech at a time like this. Every audience has to be approached at the proper time and place. And every audience has to be reached through the proper medium. And if we wish to reach audiences of millions, we have to use one of the media of mass communication, the press, radio, or television. But whatever media we use, and whatever audiences we reach, the questions to ask are the same. Who is talking? What is he saying? What medium of communication is he using? To whom is he speaking? What response is he getting? The answers to these questions are the guideposts to effective communication. They help us to that understanding of one another that is essential for successful living and working together.